Hello, this is Will Morris with another Transformation Tuesday. Today, we're opening the digital front door on telemedicine. This is our two-part series on telemedicine. And last week, we, or last uh, installment, uh, we discussed a lot of the powers of telemedicine. Today, we have a unbelievable um, panel, um, experts in a variety of fields, both uh, infrastructure, uh, care delivery, as well as other service incumbent providers, and then um, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Anmon Johnson, who is the CEO of the American uh, Telemedicine Association. So, so we have a really diverse uh, conversation, and so we hope uh, to inform, inspire. Uh, please use the Q and A. Um, we do not have a prepared script. Uh, we will take this in the direction that it needs to go to address your questions around what best practices have emerged to really, really achieve optimal patient experience, optimal access and care affordability um, in this telemedicine digital transformation. So I'll go ahead and um, I'll have the uh, individual panelists uh, introduce themselves and a little bit about their role and then we'll get started. So first off, uh, Patrick Dooley is the uh, Vice President of Product of Revenue Cycle Management and Analytics and Artificial Intelligence at Change Healthcare. Um, Patrick. Sure. Uh, thank you. Nice, uh, nice to be here. Um, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so um, uh, my background, 15 years in revenue cycle technology, uh, right now focused on um, our uh, analytics and AI strategy and revenue cycle uh, at Change Healthcare. Um, which encompasses, um, you know, use of traditional analytics uh, to, to maximize your revenue cycles efficiency, as well as um, using those analytics to help streamline uh, the digital patient experience. Um, so, um, and prior to, prior to my time at Change, I spent about a year with MD Live, um, you know, um, who's a, a launching their virtual primary care offering. Awesome. So we'll, we'll make sure we uh, pepper Patrick with, well, how does hospital systems or providers get paid and reimbursed in this new architecture? Um, next is Ann Mon Johnson. Uh, she is the CEO of the American uh, Telemedicine Association. Ann. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. And I, I'm looking forward to this panel and this discussion. Uh, the ATA, the American Telemedicine Association, Today represents over 400 organizations that are committed to the vision that we want to ensure that people get care where and when they need it, that when they do, they know it's safe, effective, and appropriate while enabling clinicians to do more good for more people. And this has been quite a year for the ATA, quite a year for our members, um, all of whom uh, have really responded to this crisis with incredible energy and innovation. So it's really a pleasure to speak on behalf of them. We really represent the voice of the industry and it's very exciting to be a part of this. Fantastic. Uh, next, we have Dr. Gita uh, uh, Nar, who is the general manager of healthcare and life sciences and the executive medical director at Salesforce. Gita, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, well, no, my, my privilege to be here in, in such company, I appreciate it. So joined Salesforce about, about a year ago, and gosh, what a humbling time to be thinking about digital engagement and, and the cloud, right? So I'm excited to see the acceleration of, of telemedicine, of digital engagement, of, of innovation in such historic times, but also very humbled by the many things going on in the world today and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And last, uh, uh, Leah Sims is the practice leader in marketing strategy of healthcare uh, insurance and life science division. Uh, at Verizon. Uh, Leah, thank you for joining. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm, I'm uh, so uh, thrilled by the opportunity to spend this hour uh, talking about something that Verizon is increasingly passionate about, which is getting um, uh, both providers and patient groups connected through technology. And we consider that a core part of our DNA. Telecommunications is our business. And we've spent the last year uh, through COVID and, and, and today really helping um, those groups connect through uh, device deployment, but also uh, you guys may have seen, we launched a telehealth platform, Blue Jeans Telehealth, uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago and um, are very focused on, on that uh, deployment. But the other thing we know we have a, a large responsibility over and we'll talk about here, I'm sure, is addressing digital divide, something that uh, a lot of folks turn to Verizon and carriers to discuss when it comes to some of the disparities of getting the most needful populations connected 
uh, to their clinicians through telehealth capabilities. So I, I look forward to talking about that today too. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. So let's start, I think, with foundation. And, and um, you know, Anne, I, I, I wonder if you could help kick us off. And you said a, a, a quote that I'm going to steal, but um, I think it's relevant that out of this pandemic is not an opportunity, but an obligation. And I wonder if you could share a little bit about kind of what the ATA, I imagine your phone has been ringing and people are asking for help. What are, what are you been doing in terms of just core blocking and tackling, kind of moving the needle to where we need to be? But then where are we going? That's, that's the more exciting things. And what in this whole you know, collaboration, what are you hearing from members? What are you hearing from patients? Where do you feel like the puck is going? And then we can layer on the experts here in the other domains to kind of see, does, does this align with, with your bold vision? I will take a shot at it. How about that? And um, for starters, I think it's always important to remember that the pandemic served to accelerate trends that were already in place. So when I reference the obligation, I'm really talking about the disparities that had been in place a long time ago and had been documented through things like the Dartmouth Atlas since the 1990s, where it showed that your um, healthcare was a function of where you lived, your geographic, you know, your healthcare destiny was defined by your geography. And so what's happened in the last year, not just the acceleration of telehealth and not just the huge surge and use of it by both consumers and clinicians, and quite frankly, the acceptance of it on all sides, but also this incredible um, and important discussion at a national level about the racism that has been pre prevalent in the US for a long time and how the healthcare system has been unequal in terms of how it's serving Americans and in fact, folks around the country or the globe. And so what we talk about is the notion that there was never sufficient gr a number of clinicians to reach the population. There was insufficient quality or inadequate or inconsistent quality. And so when we talk about the obligation now, it's really under the guise that we want to help drive the use of technology, in particular telehealth, to mitigate these disparities that have been so exposed. I would say the other thing that we're doing as an association is really ensuring that telehealth is not a pandemic only tool. And so that we don't revert back, that we don't go off the telehealth cliff. And, and everybody's aware of the waivers that were put in place during the public health emergency. But quite frankly, we have a lot to do to ensure that the waivers become permanent as much as possible, as much as feasible. Um, and then, you know, with all of that, drive what the new form delivery of care looks like. It's not all in person. It's not all virtual. It's not going to be that way. And so what does that look like? Because historically, we had a bias um, around brick and mortar in the U.S. healthcare system. And now we're really wanting to ensure that virtual, because it can bridge access, because it can close gaps in care, because it can ensure that more people get quality health care, how, how does that look? What does that look like? And who's going to help inform that conversation? And we're clearly very committed to that as well. Leah, I wonder if you can, you know, I would imagine from Verizon, you know, out of this, you have two um, things emerging. Um, one is a workforce and a workforce that could work from home and enabling that, right? We need people to be employed and we need to ensure that employment is, is, is available to all Americans. And um, so one is what is Verizon's kind of obligation strategy? You know, the need to work from home, but the need for health at home and the ability to kind of provide those services, not to, to create the, the digital divide. Yeah, no, we're very focused on that. Um, in fact, when uh, the pandemic hit last year, we had um, our customers pivot to us in two strong ways. First, we spent a lot of time <laughs> enabling workforces to move to home uh, and equipping them to do that um, from, you know, get, core capabilities to devices, to connectivity, all of those things, because uh, folks need to rapidly move their non-essential, but still essential 
uh, workforces to a home-based environment or really an anywhere environment. And our, and our narrative has really changed over the last six months because we recognize that what was a work from home narrative last year is evolving to a work from anywhere narrative now. And I think um, people really uh, on both sides want, um, want that flexibility and need the capabilities to do that. Uh, but I also wanted to touch on something Anne said about um, about virtual first. We see a tremendous opportunity um, to really uh, lead along with our partners like uh, ATA, this idea of virtual first the same way we did with mobile first. When I came to Verizon 10 years ago into our healthcare practice, one of the biggest narratives we were really talking through with our customers and with the industries across industry uh, was around mobile first to look at um, digital transformation through a mobile first lens so that they didn't have to come back later and figure out how to make their capabilities um, untethered from physical spaces and, and able to um, be mobilized. And I think there's an opportunity now to create that same dialogue uh, with uh, healthcare delivery around what a virtual first care model could look like. Uh, and to Anne's point, to make sure that it wasn't just a gap fill measure or a temporary, um, you know, a fill for for COVID, but a new model for care and really looking at um, uh, virtual care convenience for contactless care when it's needed uh, for risk management. There's so many reasons why it's it's a great model. It's not going to fit every use case, um, but we're certainly talking to folks about. Um, thinking about their digital front door, which, you know, we've been talking about patient experience and digital front door long before COVID, but now it definitely needs to include a conversation around uh, telehealth as another digital front door to their practice. What does a hybrid clinical practice look like moving forward? What does the workforce need to look like to support that clinical practice uh, in that hybrid model moving forward? And that's where we're focusing our capabilities, our platform, and a lot of our time and energy around helping to build that connected hybrid ecosystem with care providers moving forward. That's, it's exciting. I mean, I'm, you know, you hear about that momentum and, and it, that is clearly the right thing. Well before the pandemic, we also talked about the need for personalized care, participatory care, you know, and preferences and really thinking about the patient experience. You know, um, Gita, you know, from a Salesforce perspective, obviously famously known as a, as a CRM. What is the role of this technology, this to, to kind of change the dialogue to allow us as providers, as physicians to really understand the wants, the desires and the preferences for the patient? And then how do you see kind of telehealth kind of, you know, being a layer that, that is teed up and, and, and tied into that framework? Sure. So, you know, it's really about personalizing the experience and, co and connecting patients and doctors at the right time, the right place, and the way that consumers, you know, want to be interacted with, right? So it, it's always the, the Amazon challenge, right? Don't just interact with me. Know that, you know, know I'm Dr. G, know what I like, and also anticipate, right? The, the prediction of it, right? If I'm going to miss an appointment, if I'm turning 40, although I'm not, right? You know, is it time for a mammogram and is it time to make that appointment? So I, I think it's it's all of those things and to, to Anne and, and Leah's points, right? This, this, these were all things that were brewing in the industry, but they've been accelerated. And, and so from a Salesforce perspective, we feel really primed because we've done this in so many other industries, right? Healthcare is kind of catching up. So this is not new to us by any means. We've done this in many, many industries. Healthcare very much going through the digital transformation that retail, finance, um, hospitality, right? Everyone has gone through. So I, I think it's time to really take some of those lessons learned, bring some new players to, to the market because truly the legacy systems got us here and in part contributed to some of the dysfunction that we're seeing, but also got us, you know, from manual um, paper and things to a more, more digital, um, digital encounter. But we're at a place now where we need to scale. We see globally, the population on its knees at different times in different parts of the country. And so a big part of this is just connecting patients and doctors at the right time and place, period. Absolutely. Uh, so all of this is, is important, but no money, no mission in, in reimbursement but in, around two things. You know, Ann mentioned, you know, it's about aligning these resources and optimizing for that, that successful win, but also to drive quality and outcomes and, and change, you know, rev, rev cycle. Is not just about you know money. It is usually the arbiter of quality and outcomes. You know, I'm, I'm Patrick. I wonder if you can kind of share 
you know, how you see your function analytics um, in, in, in revenue cycle helping tell the story, the value proposition of this type of delivery, that it is care at scale, that it is, um, it, can, it can provide a parity product to in person um, and sometimes actually provide superior care because of access. Yeah, thanks. And yeah, the revenue cycle is not not the sexiest part aspect of this by any means, but um, certainly an important one. Um, I think a couple of points there that I would make is in you know some of the other folks on the line um, have made around um, the digital front door. This being a new access point, and so some of the trends that we saw, um, you know, as uh, adoption uh, sp spiked and really increased, is that some of those revenue cycle best practices, uh, like financial clearance and really, you know. Um, uh, you know, eligibility screening and things of uh, these natures were really foregone. Um, it's a totally different dynamic where um, in a traditional setting, you have multiple touch points with a patient and some in-person interactions leading up to that, that point of care, where you can do all of those things on uh, working with the patient on their behalf. Whereas virtual care, quite often it's, it's at the click of a button or on demand. And there's this expectation of a um, very e-commerce like experience. Um, where a lot of the revenue cycle practices went out the door. And I think that's why you saw, um, uh, you know, I think very early on a spike in denials related to, to telehealth services, which ultimately is a provider dissatisfier for sure. But then, um, you know, you have patients questioning, why were my services denied? Why do I have to pick up, you know, the cost of this bill? Um, I think, you know, the other points of impact as you see wider adoption, um, anytime you see a shift in your, in your services and your service mix and payer mix, um, uh, particularly ones that are uh, perceived to be, uh, you know, um, sort of lower cost. So telehealth has this um, pers perspective that it can be care delivered on a, at a lower cost, um, which we don't know if that's necessarily true or not, um, but it was reimbursed that way. And so um, very early on, you saw uh, a lot of uh, increase in visits, but that per uh, uh, visit fee that people were getting was a fraction of what they would traditionally get. And so, um, you know, you, you know, good things went into place like, you know, parity measures and things like that, that were, were temporary holdover. But those are things that really need to be considered as you say, permanently evaluate, you know, where you feel like your telehealth volumes will, will sit. Because if, you know, if there's gonna be continued price pressure on those services over time, um, you need to evaluate, you know, where you sort of make up for that um, lost revenue um, in your in your broader revenue cycle. And I think the last point that I would make to your question around um, outcomes, and so this is really where it starts to get to be a blend between revenue cycle and population health, which is, um, and somebody else mentioned this virtual first, um, you know, approach, uh, which is telehealth is a really great tool uh, to use to get to get to the patient, right? You know, so there's so many challenges with patients actually showing up, um, I think, you know, to the physical appointment. And so this gives you a better shot of actually connecting with that patient. Uh, once you connect with that patient, you have a better shot of getting them to adhere to, to kind of prescriptions, adhere to, you know, uh, referral, you know, uh, referrals and things of that nature. And so those will ultimately um, lead to more preventive health uh, along the lines, which leads to greater um, uh, cost, you know, outcomes and health outcomes down the road. Yeah, and I, I mean, because uh, you of, oftentimes, I'm sure you hear that common refrain of, of you know, it should be paid less because it's not the same. And, and, and to me, it's apples and orange. It is a tool, but it's a different tool and it should be, you know, leveraged in a different model and schema. So, uh, you know, applaud the ATA for just an amazing job educating educating folks, I think that's the number one thing in, in driving payment parity and legislation. But how do we continue the dialogue and prevent slippage, but, but you know, also not just automate a broken process, not just say, you know what, today I was gonna have an e &M, and now I'm gonna have a virtual e &M. How, how do we actually shift the mindset that this tool should also be considered in different ways, populations, different caregivers other than MDs, nurses, pharmacists, how do we continue kind of this this opportunity to innovate the care that we provide, not just the technology. Well, I think it's important to remember that what we're doing is that we are delivering care, that we're not here to deliver technology. Mm -hmm. The technology is the means to the end. And I think somewhat related to that is, 
if you ask Gita, I think 15 minutes or 20 minutes of her time is worth the same amount, regardless of how, what modality she chooses to deploy that in. So when we hear comments about somehow telehealth should always be less expensive, there's an investment that goes on and there's an investment in the platforms and the technology and what we're finding even more so, and certainly a number of papers have come out with this notion that there's an educational effort to not only educate the patients on what's happening and how to use the technology and how to have an exchange with their clinician, but with the clinicians as well. So there, there's a fair amount that we still have to do on the education front. And uh, so a lot to be remain there. But at the end of the day, you point to solutions like remote patient monitoring, where they're able to really, you know, keep a pulse check over literally dozens, hundreds of patients. And through that technology, number one, call a clinician's attention to what really matters versus what is just noise and basically enable them to practice at the top of their license. So this was an expression that I had no idea what it meant before the pandemic. And now I get it. Now I own it, this idea of practicing at the top of your license. So the, the innovation is, is there, it continues to be there. Um, and the use cases will continue to come out in terms of how telehealth has made a huge difference. So we think that's really going to, you know, guide a lot of these conversations and inform a lot of these discussions. Thoughts from uh, uh, Dr. G or Leah? Sure. No, I, I think I think Anne really hit it right. Which is when a when a when a patient comes in, what they want is access, right? They want a service. They want a service for a consultation. Or a question right now, just medical information, accurate medical information, which can certainly be done virtually, is very um, impactful and informative. You know, that said, babies still have to be born, surgery still have to be done. So I, I would not say that, that telemedicine is a silver bullet and we can start ripping down hospitals, right? The truth is we need both mm -hmm. and we need to figure out a way to have complementary health systems that are more efficient, more personalized, and ultimately driving outcomes and keeping people safer at home. But that's certainly the ultimate goal. I was gonna to say too, we have a, um, a, a virtual care advisory group of clinicians that's been advising us um, for the last year or so as we've been developing our platform and really thinking about our connected health strategy. And one of the things they're very quick to remind us <laughs> is that the, the period of time that the patient is on with the physician is not the sum total of the visit. Um, there's been a, a lot of advice they've given around uh, what that visit should look like um, from check-in to check-out and how the patient is cared for by other care team members uh, as part of that process and whether complete replication of an on-site visit is really you know, the, the goal of virtual care. Um, but to Anne's point, I think the more we see uh, RPM integration uh, it, it evolve and as uh, telehealth capabilities mature, the more parity I think you'll begin to see between what's provided to a patient in office versus what can happen you know, in a visit. It's more than just the conversation with their physician. And I also think if you look at the expanded reimbursement under the fee schedule for this year um, that allowed more time, uh, billable time for physicians to really focus on chronic disease, I think CMS and others really need to see that telehealth can help to Patrick's earlier point, um, can we track and prove that telehealth actually uh, helps clinicians uh, track chronic disease better, stay more closely connected to their patients than they would on um, scheduled on-site visits? Does it actually enable you to, to develop a, a closer connection and more accountability there with, with the patient through these capabilities? I would argue on paper you would um, if we can bridge those digital divide issues and get those who need them the most um, more connected through telehealth than they would be um, with transportation issues and others trying to get to an office. So I think the, the data is there, but I think there are some proof points that still need you know, some care and attention over time, right? And that, that we'll be watching and others to say, yeah, it's, it's actually improving our ability to monitor, monitor and care for those with chronic diseases. Um, and, you know, that, that warms people, I think, to more uh, of the uh, parity of reimbursement versus, you know, um, 
you know, telehealth just being a quick conversation and, and, and not reimbursable at the same rate. Again, I think the more we augment that experience to include those other assessments and the other ways that we care for a patient in an office visit, um, the more, the closer to parity, I think we'll see that get from um, a care and reimbursement status. Absolutely. So, so we had a, a good question uh, from, from the audience was, around the chronic disease management and one of the cornerstones being um, remote patient monitoring. And the question was, how do we deal with not just health literacy, but technical literacy? And does that have a risk of furthering divides? So, so how do we approach this? What are kind of the magical turnkey solution that you, you just plug it in and it works to more pragmatic, you know, um, you know, solutions, whether it be the geek squad at home doing the full install, like, what works, what's not ready for prime time, and, and what's the opportunity? Where's the, 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 the white space? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to take a first step. First of all, the geek squad in my house is my nine-year-old, so <laughs> way more um, than me and dad. She's, she's just on it, which is which is in, it, which in itself, right, is the next generation of, of physicians, next generation of, of uh, patients, nurses, et cetera. So I think number one, um, infrastructure is undeniable. Again, we keep seeing this globally uh, as we go through the pandemic. So infrastructure has to be an investment, hands down. Secondly, you know, I'm a big believer in intuitive technologies, right? And then the training of that is obviously you have to make an investment in the infrastructure and the training. But if you actually build technologies that are intuitive and don't require so much upkeep, if you will, and again, as generations get more and more savvy and are you know, living in a world where everything is digital, I, I think the, the curve really, really gets, gets smaller, right, in terms of getting folks up to where they need to. But, you know, I would say those are the, the number two kind of things that, that I think are impactful. Yeah, and I would just like so to just, say, it's not just the patients, uh, I want to say the providers too, we see this, try to get them to install a, you know, Chrome extension or a browser extension, and you might as well just, you know, unplug the computer. But yeah, there, there's both sides. But you know, well, I'm gonna give you the flip side of that, right? Because as docs, we get we get a bad rap in health tech, right? There's always this, ah, that stupid doctor is getting in the way of the, of the EHR, right? How about that EHR is getting in the way of the doctor, right? Because the reality is we never had to be trained how to use a stethoscope, an MRI, a CT scanner, we docs, we love technology. We love innovations. Give us the latest and greatest study in R&D. We're there. We're all about curing cancer, getting to the end of this pandemic. Look what we do with this vaccine, right? So I want to give our docs a big shout out. I you know, Listen, I, 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 I don't have to, that'll be our next next month's conversation about click box medicine and, you know. Exactly. We got to raise the bar on the technology. Yeah. That's really what it is. It's the I technology. Like it. It's got to work with the doctors, not against the doctors. That's the problem. That's fundamentally. I'd say nursing has it a little bit worse than, than we do, but yes. All right. Sorry, Patrick, you were uh, about to, to yeah, and I'm not going to touch that I conversation. To, um, we can uh, talk about but, uh, human factors, engineering, to, EHR, Patrick, go. <laughs> no, the two, so the two approaches regarding remote, remote patient monitoring that I would, uh, I would highlight and just add on there. And first of all, you know, agree with the sentiment uh, of the question and the risk of introducing remote patient monitoring. And then there's risk in, you know, furthering the divide on some of the, the, the factors of um, determinants of care and, and all of those, you know, those types of issues. But I think the way that I've seen um, remote patient monitoring sort of tactics that were successful is two ways. One, um, trying to harness the consumer devices that are already pretty pervasively used. So, so really avoid um, a, a healthcare specific device strategy, unless, unless it's like a very chronic condition where you know, kind of that sort of investment and, and very focused attention on a patient population makes sense. But if you're trying to do it for a broad array of different types of, of patients, um, seeing what um, Epic, or not Epic, uh, I, uh, Apple, Google, those consumer device companies are doing through the devices that everybody knows how to use. Um, uh, there's been a lot of advancements in smartwatches, smartphones, et cetera. Um, the second thing that I would point to that I think somebody has uh, you know, uh, called attention to before is, is telehealth, you know, it doesn't have to be this huge shift all the way to the other side where it's entirely virtual. You can start to create, um, so leverage remote patient monitoring technology in a physical setting that is, that is uh, supported by somebody skilled in, the, skilled in the use of that technology. 
And so uh, if there's hybrid models where you can deploy, I think the, the models that I saw were um, where you deployed clinics on site at a large employer, for example, mm -hmm. um, where they would be a trained uh, nurse or a trained you know, support agent that would be sitting there and then people would stop by the booth, um, get their health, their, their biometrics measured, and then they would go about their day. Um, you know, those are the ways that you can start to bridge some of the challenges with getting a device in the mail and figuring out what do I do with it? Um, um, and then ultimately just not following up. So, so we have a, a lively audience, uh, which I really appreciate. So please keep on uh, asking questions. Um, so, and, and actually both of them are one through the lens of the patient, one's through the lens of the clinicians. Uh, for the patient is, you know, my, uh, my parents are in the late uh, uh, 70s, 80s, and they feel like they're talking to a TV uh, and they don't see any credibility in the process. How do you see us engaging them better? I can, anyway. I, can uh, I can jump in there uh, as well. So um, I think, you know, so with, uh, and again, like in, in a past life, you know, the, the data, you know, showed that um, uh, Medicare patients typically um, were more comfortable with telemedicine visits provided from an existing relationship that they already had. And mm -hmm. so I think that is, you know, um, you're more than likely, you know, need to follow that hybrid model of an in-person care plus um, use it as a supplement to that, to that care in order to establish the credibility of that in-person um, relationship with your physician. But then also when there's just a, a touch point needed, uh, leverage telehealth so that um, uh, the physician can, can access, access you as the patient um, without requiring you to come into, into the doctor's office. Um, the other thing to just you know, call out, which is um, it's, it's heavily marketed telemedicine is as this, um, you know, I think FaceTime with doctors, right? Um, but it's 80% uh, of 90% uh, of the visits that we saw at MD Live were, you know, were telephone. Um, and so uh, you don't have to just talk into a screen. You don't have to do anything you're uncomfortable with. Um, you, you, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's, you know, picking up a phone and, um, and hopefully talking to somebody you've established that trust with. Yeah. And, and Dr. G, I wonder from your practice, I can speak about my experience and I've sort of heard this anecdotally, or maybe Ann, you actually have the data. Um, it's funny, you know, when I'm on a, 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 with a patient via a telepresence, I'm looking at them, or at least there's a perception that I'm looking at them. I have my information, I have their, their picture and the camera is in line of field of view, right? Um, as opposed to what they normally see is this, while I'm playing the human interface trying to keep up with, and we won't go down that rabbit hole, but keep up with the record. Um, I'm curious if you, if you had positive examples where there is, you know, back to that credibility that you actually see me and there's that is a little bit more of a connection despite it being done over an electron. Yeah, you got it. I mean, I, I think there's there's probably just like in person visits. There's there's good website manner. There's bad website manner, right? And our patients have received both of us both of them during the pandemic. We'll we'll start with the good, right? We'll leave with the good. We'll always. So the oh. good is to your point. We're actually looking patients more in the eye than we did before, because in an in office visit, to your point, we're doing paperwork, we're doing documenting, we're we're doing six different things. The the video visit kind of forces us. It's like calling our family, right? You're not calling them. Um, to, to talk to them like this, right? You just wouldn't call them if you're busy, essentially. So it really forces you to have the eye time. That said, we talked about training, right? A lot of our docs are not used to this and particularly on mobile devices, what's happening is we're, get, we're getting a lot of, you know, we're getting a lot of this, we're getting a lot of um, nose hair, you know, it's, it's, it takes time to sort of understand that angles matter, lighting matters. And we're all also learning this in the Zoom world, right? I've, I've often had this situation with my light and my, you know, so it's, so it's taken a little bit of time to, to get up to snuff. I would say it's not rocket science and our docs are more than capable of doing it. Um, I do want to comment on what Patrick said, which is when, you know, when our clinic went uh, virtual for a bit at the beginning of the pandemic, and I worked with medical students at the University of Miami, you know, I remember this one patient and the medical student kept trying to get the virtual visit set up and it must have been like five minutes and 10 minutes and 20 minutes. And I was back to back and I was like, Can, you know, what's going on? And, and she's like, well, there's this, he's having an internet problem. He's not able you know, keep getting him on the line for a second and then he drops. 
And the whole time she's talking to him on the phone. And I said, could you just hand me the phone? We don't, we don't need the video component. Like he's here for a BP check. And I'm like, what's his blood pressures? What's he taking? What? So we did the whole thing, but I just remember there was this pause because the medical student was like, well, we're doing telemedicine. How can we possibly do that without the video? And I'm like, he's not physically here. I'm not physically there. Boom, that's telemedicine, right? So the phone remains the number one underutilized resource. And to Anne's point, you know, the technology, well, you and I, we could care less, right? Are we able to take care of our patients quickly, efficiently answer their questions? And when you do that for a patient, I will tell you they are a believer and they will never come into your office unless they are having a baby or need a procedure or surgery. So it's about it's about nailing, nailing the algorithm. And hey, Will, I was going to say yep. too, uh, in the fall, Verizon, um, on the Verizon Media Group side, we did a number of consumer surveys around telehealth um, through our Yahoo and AOL properties and really asking, what's your experience been through uh, COVID uh, with the telehealth uh, you've been offered and just a lot of deep dive questions on that. And, and there was a split in demographics in terms of comfort level. We definitely saw aging in place uh, populations with a little less um, uh, affinity for it. I don't won't, won't say comfort level, but they don't like it as much. Uh, and when we asked them to give us a little more feedback about that, what it really comes down to, I think, in a lot of instances is uh, what Patrick said about it being the equivalent of a FaceTime call or a phone call. They don't see that as a visit. To, and again, that goes back to my earlier comment of the, the sum total of their visit to their physician's office encompasses them being able to tell their story. Uh, I, I remember my dad's first telehealth visit during COVID and I asked him how it went. And he said, it was a quick conversation, but I didn't really feel like I got to tell my story. And I, they didn't give me a clipboard where I got to write down all the things that are, have been going on with me, um, which, you know, we all hate the clipboard, but we can't underestimate um, uh, with, with those folks, how they're carrying their health story with them everywhere they go. And there's not always a confidence level that, um, that everyone they're talking to knows their, <laughs> their complete story and, and all of their medications and every specialist that they're seeing and who really owns their health story. Um, and so that's already uh, a prevailing underpinning concern, um, whether we're talking about telehealth or on-site care. Uh, and so I think the more we can care for that concern with those populations in a telehealth visit to say, this isn't just a quick phone call, um, we're going to give you an opportunity. So that can be everything from the check-in point, being able to capture um, their, um, their, their reason for visit and their symptoms or some of the things that have been going on. They want to know that somebody's reading that um, before jumping into that visit and that um, they have an opportunity to really tell that story. But um, the younger demographics, millennials and younger, and some Gen Xers were uh, found, uh, to your point, well, the visit more favorable because their physician was looking them in the eyes. We actually did have a number of people who commented and said, I felt like my physician paid closer attention to me in my telehealth visit than they do when I come in the office because they were looking at me the whole time we were talking and I really felt like they were listening. Yeah. So I think it's a difference of expectation that we have to be mindful of. Yeah. And, and I would, I just want to comment on one thing that Patrick said in terms of this idea that you can't um, that you need an in-person visit first. I think I'm extrapolating a little bit from what you said, Patrick, in order to build trust and then telehealth can be used more effectively. I, the, the resistance I have to that is because the surveys results are variable, even with older Americans. And depending on how it's done, you can build very effective relationships and they don't have to start with an in-person interaction in order to make that happen. And so we really resist this notion that you need the in-person in order to start the relationship because it just sets a bad precedent. And we think that deployed correctly and deployed well, you can engage people through their story or through their interaction so that you're building trust from the onset, from the get-go. And I... I I couldn't agree more. It's never a generalization. That's our most dangerous thing when we have these, you know, headlines. I would use the the secondary pandemic of of mental health. You know, patients who are scared. You know, maybe even just COVID, but other things. They are agoraphobic. They're they're frightened. You know, what an opportunity to actually build a relationship in a patient who we wouldn't know 
anything about them otherwise. And I think, you know, these are the unknown unknowns, these, these new white space opportunities that um, we need to tell these stories more. Um, we have a couple other questions or around like education and how do we avoid physician burnout using telemedicine? I would like to shamelessly plug the ATA. I think there's tremendous, you know, resources um, that you all have curated and content. There's some video content. You guys have podcasts, um, um, you know, and would you agree? I mean, there is some great content for both providers, patients of how to perform appropriate interactions and avoid kind of, you know, to get this point, the, the camera going north. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So right. we, we've made a lot of our content um, free and available to the public during the pandemic so that we really want to encourage people to, to have access to it. I will make a shameless plug. We have our annual meeting coming up in June and it's going to be every Tuesday and Thursday. And we do have sessions on clinical clinician resilience. Um, Christopher Sharp, who's a physician at Stanford and Peter Yellowlees, who's a psychiatrist at UC Davis, both big proponents on how telehealth can really not only provide value to the patient, but also really reduce the burnout element as well. So we have two other kind of questions I'm gonna lump because it, and, and perhaps it, it ties to the technology, but it's also empowering. Um, one is around uh, you know, nursing home visits and the ability to also auscultate. So thinking about technology is not just what we hear, but um, heart sounds, even rhythm strips, even um, you know, uh, uh, you know, baby fetal heart, heart rates, as well as just the simple act of multimodality interaction, right? Sharing test results, having a shared conversation, if you will, around a, a, around a piece of paper or an image. Um, a lot of questions on where are we? And one uh, comment was, is this an evolutionary dead end? Or do we see that the tech is gonna get there where we are going to be able to gain, you know, physical strengths like that we would normally have in the, in the, in the in-person visit, but maybe even superpowers, um, you know, achieving uh, uh, insights that we otherwise wouldn't have in the normal office visit. Um, comments? I would just say, I think a lot of the technology is there. It's the interoperability we have to solve for, uh, the integration of those capabilities. Um, you know, when you look at RPM, there's, there's some great RPM <laughs> devices out there today that do all of those things, auscultation uh, and, and similar. Um, but it's getting those um, plugged in. It's solving for the, um, the, the distribution and management of those devices and the reimbursement of them. Um, we talk to health systems around RPM management. One of the big challenges is that they have, they have patients in multiple RPM trials and they're usually you know, pro provider driven, so a practice driven, and they, they're, they're not necessarily centrally managed within a health system. So you can have hundreds of RPM trials going on with you know, almost as many RPM providers, and there's not a central place where that's, you know, where that's being managed as sort of in a one-off fashion. So the integration of all of that, and then being able to surface that data in a meaningful way to support clinical conversations um, and, and integrate those with telehealth is another challenge. You know, we're talking to our customers about that in two buckets, what they need in terms of pre-assessment vitals for a, a telehealth visit and how much those can be replicated. And then what about all of the other uh, chronic disease management, RPM clinical trials that, they uh, that they're conducting. Um, and without exception, our, our advisors, our clinical advisors tell us we would love to have that RPM data from those clinical trials surfaced in a telehealth visit. So we could talk through the trend data um, that we're seeing or the alerts that we're getting from those third party um, data monitoring services, but right now that capability doesn't exist. I think a lot of people are trying to solve for it, but it's very complex. The ecosystem of RPM, there's so much potential, but it's the interoperability and the integration challenges I think um, we're all trying to solve for and figure out the best models. And there may not be one size fits all model. Uh, there's probably gonna be several of them that sort of bubble up to the top. But I don't think it's a dead end evolution, but I definitely think it's an evolution. It's something that's gonna take time to solve for. Yeah, and it's definitely, so the, I agree the capability is there, um, but right now the challenge we're facing, like change, we, change is actively trying to, to impact this, uh, the interoperability aspect as well as on the analytics side. You have so much data to present to both the provider and the patient. 
but it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so uh, providers are data-driven people, but they're still people and it's overwhelming uh, when you present them with that information. And patients, you know, uh, can be data-driven or not. And you need to help them make sense of the information as well. So, you know, when you talk about um, uh, analytics and, and the things that we're, you know, we're, we can do in the industry, it's one, how do we capture the data, which I think there's, there's um, a lot of data to be captured now. And then two, the big challenge that we face um, in the industry is then how do you make sense of it for the person that you're presenting it to? We hear the word dashboards more than we did <laughs> five or 10 years ago. <laughs> but when everyone was talking about big data, we want the data or we want actionable information, which was everyone's favorite phrase. And now we hear, no, we need a dashboard. We need it meaningfully extrapolated and presented how I need it, when I need it, because clinicians don't have time to go um, you know, dig for all of that at the point of care. So yeah, dashboards are a big conversation now, I think, for everyone. Dr. G, I was wondering, you know, so, so I agree, it's, it's, it's not just more data. We actually don't, we actually have tons of data. We, we actually barely make sense with the data we have. It's how do we actually make meaningful decisions at the right time to the right person at the right format and time. Um, you know, I, I see that kind of also in the quest of the, 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 the CRM, right, is, is I want to know everything about the patient, but, but yet, you know, is that just more information for our provider team and our care team? How, how, do, we, how do we strike that balance where it's the appropriate information? It's not just data, but it's true information. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think that's the, that's the holy grail, right? It's, it's personalized medicine, which I think has, has two components, right? There's the personalized experience, which is I know you're William Morris and this is, you know, the things that I think you need. I also can predict what I think you will need based on, you know, certain patterns and behaviors, but it's, it's the analytics, it's the predictive analytics to, to really hone in on it. And, and to, you know, lay in Patrick's points, it's too much information. No one wants too much information. I want the right information, right? And then as far as the technology piece to it, look, you know, the technology exists. The, the hard part is the people in the process. The, the technology clearly exists. It's the wisdom to know how to use it, how to implement it, how to complement complement it again with the legacy systems. You know, I think that's why we're seeing CRM, Salesforce in this space doing so well because the the the, the problems of the of the time period, right? Like EHR has helped us digitize medical records. We can we can check the box on that. Did they create problems that we didn't see? Of course, right? So you know, we we now see ourselves complementing that to to handle that personalized experience, to handle that predictive part. But I would argue that you know there is a component here around the the process, the culture. Th those are the hardest things that we have to deal with. I I, I think the technology is is there, and I know, and whoever asked the question about you know is it, is it wasted time? I don't think innovation is ever wasted time, right? Look at all of us here on this on this Zoom. Um, if someone hadn't had the crazy idea that we could do video meetings, I mean, how would we have how would we have made it through 2020, right? So, innovation is never wasted. I, I would never say that. And, you know, from you know, is this a common theme that you're hearing from your your, your members? Is, you know, we see the opportunity, we see payment period, all of the stuff in line, but we're you know, our eyes are wide open of saying, oh, you know, interoperability, how do I navigate? How do I choose the right sphygometer or the next magical widget? And how do we avoid spending, you know, capital out the wazoo on chasing widgets? And then on the flip side is how do we prevent the overwhelming saturation of our patients where their time is, is valuable too. And we need them to get vaccinated, get a colonoscopy, do all the right things, uh, you know, a list of other things. And then our providers, you know, I'm sure Dr. G does not want, you know, Fitbit data, you know, steps blown into her in basket every single day. Um, but, you know, where do you see the ATA kind of creating that awareness, but also trying to, to, to manage expectations and, and, and navigate us through these, you know, uncharted waters. And then I have to jump in at some point and I'll, I'll be quiet now because I have a comment. No, 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 go, go. Because I was going to say if Dr. or G is a I can, cardiovascular. I'm going to take this because I get this all the time as the, as the digital doc, right? Every patient wants, they just want to send us everything, what they've eaten, what their steps are. And will you and I, like, you know, I don't need to know every heartbeat that you've had and neither do you. That's, that's the disconnect in, in medicine is the consumer doesn't, Oh, the consumer doesn't understand what they're buying. 
and what's needed, right? So, you know, wearing one of these means, oh, Dr. T is going to know everything about me. You know, I'm not interested in every heartbeat, right? I'm interested if there's a pattern, a bell curve, is there a place where you're missing a beat? Is there a place where you're heart rate gets really high or low. I'm looking for trends. Mm -hmm. And obviously it depends on whether you have a medical condition or not, right? If your heart rate goes faster when you run, that's a good thing, yeah. right, right? Well, this is what we learned in medical school. So my challenge is always with the consumer and helping them understand that more is not always better, right? Big is not always better. And also, as you think about just the healthcare landscape, it's, it's understanding that as we, and I, and, I, and all of us are excited by, right, seeing the retailization of healthcare, we've got CVS, Walmart, we have more access, which is always going to be a good thing and more telemedicine because you're, you're improving access. But consumers still don't understand the difference when they see someone like me or Dr. Morris, right? You're not going to find a rheumatologist at CVS Minute Clinic, not anytime soon. So when one of my patients puts on a watch like this and then goes to CVS and says, oh, I've got the best care ever, right? And then they come back to see me because their steroids are all messed up. Somebody messed with their embryo. So I, I think part of this is as we consumerize healthcare, we need to improve health literacy and help individuals understand what they're buying, what is the value of it. Less is always going to be more. And you know, there is a relationship that people don't understand, that cradle to grave relationship you get at the Cleveland Clinic, you get through using telehealth properly and leveraging complementary to brick and mortar. It's so different if you hop on a virtual visit with me and something is wrong and I say, I'll meet you in my office or I'll meet you in the emergency room, right? That's not a transaction, that's a relationship. Mm. And when things go sour, like we've seen with the pandemic, it's that relationship that gets you to the other side because it's that patient of mine that I know has lupus, pulmonary fibrosis. And when they go south, like I know exactly when they gotta go to the ER, I know when we gotta move, move, move. And when you're seeing someone at a CVS or when you're relying on this device, there is a limit, right? There's a limit to these things, but, but this is not, um, it's not that easy, right? It's not that transactional if you're really thinking about your healthcare in a, in a holistic way. And, and certainly there's a place for it, you know, if you need a, a, a vaccine, great that you can go in and out, you know, and get your milk and eggs. I, I very much believe in that because that improves access. But when you do have an underlying chronic disease or a situation, that relationship is really important. And I think the, the consumer needs to start understanding that. And I hope COVID helps us explain that to them. So I'll get off my high horse here, but. <laughs> it raises the point of, of literacy to a different demographic group, because we talk about tech literacy for the aging in place population, but um, the education we need to provide for millennials and younger about continuity of care and um, you know what might be compromised if they spend um, all of their um, their healthcare resourcing through retail or urgent care or outside of you know the traditional traditional linear and longitudinal care of a primary care physician. When we surveyed most of the folks who were um, millennial or younger who responded to our surveys don't have a primary care physician and don't intend to have one, and that's a, a, a huge shift. That also, to your point, Dr. G, I think needs some focus of education so that there's you know, not something lost um, that will have to be cared for 15, 20 years from now with those patients when um, they don't have, um, you know, that, that connection to a health system and to um, a, a coordinating provider that's really looking at their longitudinal care. I think that's a, a risk that needs to be addressed too, for sure. We got a, a, a good, good question asking all of us, and very provocative, and I think it's thoughtful, is, is have we been to a doctor's visit? And what was our experience as a patient? Any feedback? You know, what are, what are the, what, what is, you know, and I, I imagine, I think the question is, 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 you know, in this fast paced transactional kind of world where people feel kind of rushed and, and, and healthcare is being, you know, as a commodity is, 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 you know, what Dr. G said, that relationship piece, and how, how do we, you know, avoid going so, so, so fast and so quick that we avoid a transactional feeling to, you know, really, really establishing care. I can say without a doubt, it, it's about the relationship. It's not about a transaction. If I go in there with an expectation that I just need a prescript and like, I'm out, like that's on me. Um, but, but I, I think it's what you put in, what you get back, but that is, 
other people with their experience, either in person or digital, that that you see kind of shapes your thought process? Sure. I mean, I'll I'll tell you, I have any number of experiences, but as doctors, we are the worst patients, right? First of all, we know everything, um, and secondly, I, I don't. I'll, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> I do, let me tell you, especially when I go to the pediatrician, I'm like, let me tell you what my daughter needs. Da, 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 da. So I will tell you, I'm the worst patient simply because of that, right? Um, I also have a really tough name to spell. So Dr. G is not what it says on my record, right? So every time, and I will tell you, I have a relationship with my pediatrician, I have a relationship with um, my GYN. I recently got a shoulder injury, uh, shoulder injury playing tennis. And so I did, I went to my colleague who's a rheumatologist. I told her exactly what I needed, which was a steroid shot. And I went to the office, like, like I'm going in, I'm going out, I'm a busy lady. And she had streamlined everything for me, but the place we got hung up on was of course the paperwork. And my, they had about three charts for me. There was a Greta Nair. There was a Geetha Nair with one Y. There was, um, uh, I don't even remember what the other Eastern European name is that I can sometimes go by. So I will tell you that many things got messed up either in the pre-visit where I was waiting forever because they didn't realize like I had checked in that they hadn't checked me in, if you will, because they had me as someone else. Um, and I'm texting the doctor in the back like, hey, I'm here, ready for my shot. And they're like, well, no, you're not here. I'm like, I am here. <laughs> so these are these are simple things. And then when it comes to results, so, so all the things I, I think all of us probably feel this way, right? That we live and breathe in my job at Salesforce. It very much informs both what I do as a doc as well as, as a patient. It's, it's, um, it's never been a frictionless experience. I will also just share with you personally that I have an um, immediate family member with a very rare autoimmune disease, which is why I went into rheumatology. Um, and the biggest, the hardest part of putting her case together was her records. It was getting her records to Leia's point, the interoperability of, of just, and, and being a savvy healthcare consumer, I was able to get all the records, put it all together, and then realize what a rare autoimmune disease it was after I became a rheumatologist. But she really spent 30 years of her life with the wrong diagnosis, and it was a terminal diagnosis. So we were thankfully able to make it at the right time. Um, but it was the records. At the end of the day, it was the records. The pulmonologist couldn't see what the cardiologist saw, couldn't see what the endocrinologist saw. And then it was the know-how of a subspecialist, like rheumatologist, to put it all together and say, aha, that's what's going on. So um, very near and dear in my heart, why I went into my specialty, but also how I found myself in health tech, because it seemed so unacceptable that the, um, the back end was the harder part and that the clinical part was really where uh, we should all be focused, right? So. Well, we're coming up on, on top of the hour. Um, we could have gone on, I think, uh, indefinitely, which is which is great because at the end of the day, I mean, two things. Um, the innovation in this space is is explosive and it's the right thing, but the work never ends, right? Our chances to be better, to achieve um, better quality, better accessibility, and better affordability, I think, is is never ending. Um, so I wish to thank you all, uh, Patrick Drewy um, with Change Healthcare. Anmon Johnson, who is the CEO of the ATA, the American Telemedicine Association, Dr. Gita Nar, um, uh, Gita, Dr. G, um, uh, uh, Executive Medical Director of Salesforce, and Leah Sims, uh, who leads up marketing strategy and practice uh, lead for Verizon. Um, I wish to thank you all. And the, and the last uh, shameless plug is for those who are listening is to get the vaccination. Um, that is our best chance in uh, emerging out of the pandemic. And if you are unsure, ask the provider. Uh, thank you very much. This is Will Morris with uh, Transformation Tuesday and have a lovely day.